Beautiful. All right, everybody. <laughs> so excited to have you here for another day of East October. Really pumped. We're going to be working with the Saints for Life today. And today, my uh, our guest is Eric Archie. So, uh, and Is this everybody or is it just Lewis? Yeah. Mm. I'm double checking, make sure we're good to go with Lewis. Okay, that should do it. Um, we'll check and see with everyone to make sure everything's still working right. So let's try this again. Let's see if y'all can hear me better now. Can you hear me better now? Somebody throw it in the chat, let me know. All let's good see, now. testing, all good now, perfect. All right, okay. Well, if any of you didn't hear that, we're gonna try once again. Sorry about that, everyone. I had the wrong microphone on. So, basically, we're gonna do a warm, cool relationship of uh, a tonal nature. So, uh, Grisai typically is done where it's done in either a black and white or a brown and white relationship, but we're gonna take that a step further and add a bit of warm and cool relationships to things. We'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, Eric is going to do it more in a traditional style where she's going to be doing more of an umber to white and then pushing the umber's warmth and the white's cool in order to make the relationships happen. With in, ivory black. With, 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 uh, in, in addition mm -hmm. to ivory black. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And then the ivory black is sort of her dark cool and the umber is the one that's pulling it uh, over to warm. And then I'm going to be using complementary colors um, of ultramarine blue, uh, oxide red, and I'm, I even might even switch to oxide yellow and violet with a bit of cobalt blue and then white. And I'm still going to be making a neutral painting. It's just going to have the tiniest hint of color. And this is to practice the idea of tonality and warm and cool relationships. Um, so don't be scared. Get your brushes out. Start painting with this. Tell us what you're painting. Tell us where you're from. Ask us any questions you would like. And we're going to get started. We want to paint along with you. That's what we're doing. Don't paint along with us. The whole reason we're doing this is so that we, you have somebody to participate in the challenge with while you're doing it. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to close this door just in case anyone comes through. Sorry, there's going to be a loud creak. You know, for it being Halloween, though, it has a good, scary creak it to does, it. It does, yeah. You know? So... Um, tell us what y'all are painting on. I know that uh, a couple of people might be painting on the same still lives that they were working on yesterday. Boy, I've been having a blast doing these too. So I don't know if y'all can see, but what I'm doing down here is I'm just going to mix a sort of a neutral color. 
And the cool thing is, I didn't even think about this until you know a few minutes before we started, but the background I have is a brown burlap color. And then I have a piece of cloth underneath the pumpkins that are kind of a cool neutral gray, kind of almost a slate color. And that's gonna be great because that will help me create a warm, cool range between all of those. So the pumpkins will be like medium warm, the ground's gonna be like nice and cool, and we'll go from there. But first of all, I'm gonna kind of get established a, just a little bit of a drawing first. So I'm just gonna use a little bit more of my warmth over here. I was gonna say, I like how your setup and your colors that you're using in your palette are very similar. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Worked out. I just didn't even plan it that way. It just happened to be. Let's see. Even though I have it kind of folded under, I might have it just drop off the edge. And move two things just for the aspect ratio. Getting a bit of a tangent with, with the corn. I want to play with that there. Okay. All right, everyone, you gotta tell us what you're working on. Is there anybody making comments, Liv? I don't see any yet okay. about the different subjects, but I'm also very interested to hear. I'm excited to see the new iteration of today's pumpkins. Had a few yeah, versions no now. I always think it's cool when the subject is the same, but then people's handwriting really shows through mm. um, with how they approach the painting. I agree with that. It's different every time. Yeah, this is my, uh, what, this is my fourth day painting on the subject matter. Or is this my third day? <laughs> All the days are starting to go together now. Um, we have a couple people saying hi where they're from. We have Joyce from Washington again. Oh, Joyce, Hello, Joyce. Is here again. We have Marcel from Cape Town. Nice. Joyce is going to finish her hound with the Santa hat today. Oh, perfect. That's right, because I made the whole you ain't nothing but a hound dog joke. Because I, it, it was funny because be it had to be done. <laughs> Eric and I were just talking about, like, I, I made some random joke that was really just a horrible joke, but I was just like, you know, I'm just trying to fill the air with something. Uh, and when there isn't anything, I try to make a joke, and it just ends up being a really bad one. So um, I am at the age of making dad jokes. <laughs> All jokes are good jokes. There you go. And I'm of the opinion that if you have a pun, you must say it. You must say it. Regardless of how terrible it is. Well, my, my dear friend Nicholas Thorpe, who used to be here, um, he always had another pun. He was, uh, he would be the master of that. So. Just. I like how Shane Neal says it. He, he would say, just lining up for the putt. Hmm. I always kind of liked that. We have Jean. Jean is painting an onion, some shallots, and an old copper pot. Awesome. Sue says hi from Virginia, enjoying this while she paints a commission. Perfect. Congratulations um, on having a good commission. Mm -hmm. Always nice. 
Esteban is wondering. He's practicing drawing cast sculpture faces, but from photographs, and he's wondering if it's worth it, if it's not from life. Ooh, actually, I've got I've got something for you there, buddy. Um, Esteban, you said his name was. Yes. Um, I think that there are three D digitally rendered casts that if you put in um, plaster cast 3D, you know, computer generated or something, they actually go off of the principles of form. So the value relationships are stronger than just working from a photograph because they're actually using this, the same concepts. And so you actually might do yourself a bit of service using one of those images um, to help. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are a lot of options now too with purchasing casts. Um, whether you get them from a sculptor or I think even on Amazon, you can buy a cast on Amazon. Look at that. So there are a lot of options if you want to find, like it's usually like a David eye mm -hmm. or eye to nose or you know just the brow or something like that. But um, there are ways of finding some casts without breaking the bank, as they say. Benjamin is mentioning having troubles hearing Lewis again. Let's see. Really interesting. You're having troubles hearing me. It's because I'm the highest one on the thing. Perhaps it's he joined in a little later and he's watching the beginning. Are you oh, at real be. time right now? That's a good question. Okay. Uh, see if you're. At, it, it seems that might be the case. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that might be. Perfect, okay, just making sure. It is my first time switchering, being the MC, so I might be a little. She's doing great. It's a learning curve. It's a learning curve is what it is. And she's doing fantastic. She has a voice for radio and a face for pageantry, so she's a whole package. <laughs> I like how you're, you turned it around. Yes. <laughs> usually. Uh -huh. Usually you say you have a face for radio. <laughs> we have, uh, let's see, someone from Carmel in... in Carmel, Indiana? Indiana, yeah. Hey, I have lots of friends from Carmel, Indiana. I've never heard of Carmel, Indiana. It is right outside Indianapolis. It's a suburb of, basically a suburb of Indianapolis. <laughs> so that's amazing. You know, um, you know, Sarah Page Thompson's a friend. I have some friends from high school. I went to Culver Military Academy in Indiana, so like I had a lot of friends from Carmel that went there. We have someone dropping in named Tina fin Figarelli, I think oh, is how you say it. Hi from the studio next door. <laughs> and as uh, in good form here, we call her Tuna. So hi, Tuna. Shout out. I'm not committed to anything. I'm just kind of going in and throwing down compositionally where I'm hoping things should land well. That's kind of the goal. How has your palette informed your beginning of beginning stages of the painting? Well, at this at the beginning stages, I'm just taking 
a mid mid value, kind of a neutral five or four, four and a half, to just draw things out, not really paying attention to the warm, cool nature yet. <clears throat> and then um, as soon as I get a bit more information about where everything's going to be, um, which is this is about as far as I want to go, um, then I'll start adding a bit more of the cool cool and warm relationships going on. So you're creating a neutral from the... Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking a neutral using my ultramarine blue, oxide red over here. I'm not gonna use for the purpose, especially because uh, we want you to kind of use what you have in your studio. And so it's great that Erica is using black and umber um, because I think a lot of people have black and umber. But if you have ultramarine blue and oxide red, I'm going to not use black for the very purpose of trying something different than uh, what Erica is so that I encourage people to not use the excuse of being like, well, I don't have their colors. It has nothing to do with that. You can just try to find two colors that make a neutral for you, and you can use that. And so, what makes a neutral? And what makes, and, and you're at, that's a question, or are you? I mean, I know the answer, but I'm prompting you to answer. Prompting. <laughs> and what makes a neutral? Taking your two complementary colors can pull out a neutral for you. So, uh, and I'm going to start off more neutral than, than uh, more colorful for the whole purpose of this test. So I'm going to make sure I've got plenty of paint here. I'm going to add a little bit of white to make it a lighter value. So the white is what changes the value. And, um, and so I'm playing with that idea, that concept of making sure that the white can also, if you have something warm, it's going to cool it down. And if you got something cool, it's going to maybe slightly warm it up because it's a perfect neutral. So um, using that to play with the color a little bit and show kind of like how colorful you can make something that is tonally close to neutral. So I'm using raw umber and ivory black because when I was a student at Ford's Academy, that's what we used when we were transitioning from uh, drawing to painting. And you were just starting to get introduced to color. And so rather than going in with full color immediately, this kind of grisaille palette where you're exploring subtle temperature shifts, but primarily remaining in the realm of value. That's basically what we're, what we're doing. And so helping you keep basically the focus on drawing. You're not getting too distracted by color yet. There's oh, that. there goes the <laughs> thing. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry, we meant to <laughs> warn everybody, uh, but I'm assuming it happened to everybody else too, if it was nationwide that there was a big test that they were doing on uh, devices. So uh, hopefully you were aware of that and it didn't just destroy your ears. So uh, this approach here of, of keeping your palette quite neutral is, is really helpful to acclimate to color but keeping your priorities still about drawing and still about value because the painting should still work in value and things like shapes, shadow shapes, light shapes, you know, edges, all those things still apply. Um, and colors is the next challenge where it makes it a little bit harder to, to do those things. And so uh, grisaille is a great way to start um, getting into color. And so I have ivory black and raw umber and I'm beginning my underpainting here with raw umber because it's warm and transparent, um, which means I can move around and take it away. It won't, it won't create too much texture or opacity when I'm still in, in a flexible drawing stage. And it's really nice too, because as you can see on, on my palette here, that I can create um, quite a difference, even though the two pigments are quite neutral, I can still create the relationship of warm and cool. Um, as you see here, I have a warm string that's just basically raw umber and white, and then I have a, something in the middle, which is 
a little bit of raw umber, a little bit of ivory black and white. And then here at the bottom, I've started creating a cool string. And so I have, it, I have this like this right now just as basically a way of establishing my extremes. Uh, but it won't, I probably won't use maybe all of this cold blue down here. I don't think I see anything in my setup that's quite that extreme. So it might not be that, that blue, but um, it's good to know what your limits are. And that's what limiting your palette really does, um, is help you understand your extremes with color and how to create relationships. Mm. Often we might instinctually want to just look at a setup and then copy what we see because we see local color and we want to um, kind of capture the local color, but we have to remember that color only exists in relationship to other colors. And so that's what limiting your palette and creating these grisaille paintings can help you do is understand the relationships that you're making without needing the full palette. And somewhat, at least right now, um, if you need like help going, am I getting too colorful or too neutral? Use the aid of your palette. Um, so if you have a wood palette, make an umber to white to black relationship and try to stay similar to the, the hue of your palette. And if you have a gray palette, try to make one that's more neutral like this. So I know if you notice on my palette, I'm, not, I'm trying to make things maybe not too blue. I'm trying to stay either neutral. And the, my palette, I wouldn't know if it's exactly perfectly neutral, but it comes like this. It's an Edge Pro Gear Glass palette. And so it has something that's close to a true neutral. So I'm staying either slightly warm or right at that color relationship, and then I'm going warmer with it. So that way you might be able to like better know like if you're making it too colorful you know, and getting out of some sort of harmonious tonal range that we're trying to create here. Beautiful. All right, and then like I said a few days ago, the, the next thing I like to do is I like to get the big shapes in first, the big contextual um, parts of the painting. So I'm gonna go into the umber, I'm gonna make a dark background color. And I'm gonna make it more warm. Ooh, that is pretty dark. Darker than I was anticipating. We'll bring it up a little bit. We have a couple more people dropping in to say hi. We have Jer. Jer is doing a candle and a rose. Nice. Jonathan says hi from Maine. And let's see, Benjamin is doing a figure lounging over the mountains, mixing figurative and landscape. Mm. That's something you just did, Liv. Yeah. yeah. It sure is. Figure in a landscape. Classic. Liz, Liv's been working on a um, figure, the beach scene on a misty day um, with a beautiful tree line in the background. It's gorgeous. Someday it will be shown to the world. Erica, what are you working on in the studio recently? Um, I just wrapped up a big orchid painting and now I'm working on some roses again, but I'm switching it up and changing my background so it's more of a gray background, seeing, exploring some different um, value relationships with how it interacts with painting a rose. And so, don't worry, the black backgrounds aren't going anywhere. It's just added <laughs> to the repertoire. <laughs> I know people are really concerned about it. So yeah, very. This is just the a pause. She will be back. <laughs> Something also that you should know when you work with warm, cool colors like this, that if you use like a lean medium, which is what I'm using when you're painting, 
Um, if you pull up the color, it makes a warmer, transparent relationship. But if you lay more of the color down, it makes a darker, cooler uh, paint color. And that, that can be a lot of fun for creating like vibrational interaction between your, your, color, your colors that you're working with to make neutral. Taking me a second to like get this drawing. Sometimes it goes faster than yeah. others. Absolutely. That's well, interesting shapes, you know. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How much do y'all think about transparent versus opaque when painting a grisaille? I think. It's a great opportunity because, for example, in my palette, I have raw umber, which is a transparent warm, and then I have ivory black, which is relatively more opaque and cold. And so I think that not only can you create a warm, cool relationship with your mixtures, but you can also create a transparent, opaque relationship uh, with your mixtures as well. And so mm -hmm. I'm always looking for opportunity to create uh, those really to create any relationship and so um, I definitely th will think about it for this painting as well I'll try to keep my warms or my shadows warm and transparent that's um, how I usually go about doing it so um, and then that way my lights will be more opaque in relationship to my shadows. So anytime you're creating that, some sort of communication, tension, relationship, mm. whatever you want to call it, um, it's always a good thing. It's great. Very good to know. There's always um, new layers of things to think about. Where it's value, add on mm. temperature, add on something such as opacity. It just keeps going. It does. It does just keep going. Mary I like Beth. think of it as like oh. so much opportunity to explore what your paint can do. I love seeing, like even you, you have three, you have three uh, pigments you're working with, you know, two colors and white, and there's so much you can get out of it. Did you have a question? Did I interrupt you? Sorry. Oh, Mary Beth was wanting some clarification about what a lean medium is. Oh, well, um, in this instance, I actually get it already mixed. But in this instance, it is, I'm going to see if I can put it up here. It is made by Chelsea mm -hmm. Classical Studio. And it is um, linseed oil and lavender oil, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's a mixture kind of half and half. Now, uh, easy to mixture to make in your studio if you have it. It's just normal linseed oil and do a half linseed oil, half turpentine or half uh, Gamsol or whatever solvent you use um, would work. Um, I, you can also use lavender as the half and half medium. Um, and it'll just make, it makes kind of more of a, eh, kind of a watery style medium for when you're first laying in stuff and I kind of like it because I like it get, it gives things brush texture and makes them feel interesting so that's kind of why I put it in hmm. what's the like very general rule like fat over lean so yep. lean would be less oil generally mm-hmm and uh, in this instance it feels like you're adding oil to it but you're adding a thinner in the oil and because of that, it's making it a more of a lean version of, of oil. So, um, but, you know, the leanest, I guess, um, would be just straight out of the tube. Um, but sometimes, depending on the color, I also have to add oil to it just because the paint might be so dense, like the pigment relationship to the oil coming out of the tube might have been separation that happened or other things like that, so. 
also your ground. Like if your ground is really absorbent, mm. then mm -hmm. that can influence um, how the paint is applied onto the panel. Mm -hmm. Mary says thank you, or Mary Beth. Mary Beth says thank you. You're welcome, Mary Beth. Okay. It's interesting to see the different beginnings so far already, whereas Erica <laughs> is getting a much more complete drawing figured out. And I was thinking mine's a lot more like rough and scrubby. And <laughs> mm, yeah, no, this is... Um, it's coming on yours. <laughs> it's one of those things where I'm, I'm trying to not pay... I'm going to try to like make some prettier marks and not pay as close attention to uh, drawing aspects of things. I usually do that at the beginning almost every time I paint because I'm a portrait painter and that's like the most valuable and important thing to get in. But I'm changing it up because what are we doing? Facing our fears and <laughs> trying something new. My prettier marks will come later, <laughs> if at all. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, just you wait. Define pretty mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aaron is asking if you would recommend for beginners to use a limited value range. Yes, I would. It's far easier to make something feel harmonious when you have a limited uh, or a limited value range or a limited color range. Um, if it's value, it's it's a good practice because it can um, help you get a more sharp eye of seeing. You'll, your eye will get more sensitive to value relationships and changes um, if you use a limited value range. I think if, if you use a limited value range in the drawing itself, like you're not having to go from pure black to pure white within the drawing, I think that can be really helpful, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Because uh, it keeps it unified? Or are you saying the setup is compressed value-wise? Wait, say what you're saying again? So... For example, you're painting a figure in a mm -hmm. model room or something. Mm -hmm. In your drawing, you don't have to go pitch black and pure white and find, trying to do everything in between. You can mm -hmm. keep your value range quite limited and just have shadow and light, you know, keep it compressed in your drawing versus the setup could have whatever in the setup. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're saying in life, act, the actual setup that you're making shouldn't have to be a limited value range. Right. You're talking about. Yes. I'm saying the drawing itself has the limited value range. Just to clarify that the setup, like for example here, like in our setup, you know, it doesn't have to be all white objects to keep the value range limited. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. You're, you're, I was I was just trying to clarify. <laughs> it, yeah, absolutely. Is that what they were saying? Is that what it was, was the more, question? I was just making sure that that was clarified Clear. yeah. to the person asking the question. Yeah, I was just making sure I Sorry. didn't misunderstand the question. <laughs> was he? Was he? Is that what he was saying? Asking? I believe he, the question is about your painting values. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely would be helpful with painting values. And um, yeah, you, you most certainly don't need all white objects up there while you're, while you're working, but it's actually a good practice to make your eye sharp to see how you would compress things to be a lower value uh, or to, to be a more compressed value. Sorry, I'm trying to get two things done at once here and not necessarily being successful at either. <laughs> it's hard multitasking. On her face, okay. Must have, yeah, we're having troubles with that camera. It's because I have it in a different format than live streaming. And it might have, might have just overheated. They're not missing anything. Oh, no, it went out of batteries. I didn't have it plugged in.
excuse me, everyone, while I get these, um, this camera back up. An interesting question. Do you think social media has made the art world better or worse? It's a big one. Ooh. That's a double-edged sword right there. Yeah, you can get a little bit philosophical about that one. Well, I don't know if this perfectly answers the question, but I definitely think it's a blessing and a curse. I think, you know, double-edged sword, whatever <laughs> metaphor you want to use, I definitely think that it's both. Gotta agree with that, you know? Some people, that's how they break through into the art world, get their careers going is through social media, but sometimes it really can be emotionally exhausting, I think. I'd be curious if anyone in the audience has anything to contribute in that regard or their yeah. experience. Here we go. Hopefully, hopefully that works. Ah, it's back up. Thank you. Yeah. Esteban says he found East Oaks through social media, so. Well, it's absolutely helped us. That's a win for social media. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, you're not a big user of social media for your own, post, posting your own art. You are correct. What are your feelings on it? Um, it, I, believe it or not, I got, I got my career, my portrait career of doing commission work launched through social media um, back in the day when Facebook was really new. And um, it really helped me a lot uh, get my name out there. And I, I would say I attribute a lot of probably the first 100 commissions to, honestly, to Facebook. <laughs> so for that reason, um, I have to say that it's been really helpful for people like me. But I don't post a lot on Instagram, and it's not because I don't want to. It's, um, it's quite frankly to do with I, I can't take more, any more commissions right now because I'm a little behind. And um, I have, you know, I, you have, you have uh, multiple people waiting on paintings, and, you know, they see you doing other things. It may, reminds them that they want theirs done. So I'm trying to get through a certain set of commissions before I start getting back onto the social media platform, just get caught up. Um, so for those reasons, um, that's why I don't have a huge presence on there. Um, and I don't think it's necessary, but I do think it's incredibly helpful. All right, let's see here. I'm going to put... I'm going a different route this time, considering I kind of drew things in really well yesterday. Uh, this time around, I'm kind of putting swaths of color or swaths of value in different locations. And then, um, and then I'm going to use that as an opportunity to clean up edges later. And uh, yeah, in a way, kind of keep this really fresh and different and experiment a little bit. So, um, so I'm just kind of putting things down a little bit before I get the drawing all perfect. So I'm going to cut into stuff and pull things out and push things in and do it that way and see what happens. Erin is wondering if we can talk a bit about the idea of compression and how 
that plays into the relationships in your painting? Mm. Compression is a term that I never heard of until I got into school, and it's probably one of my favorite terms now because so much of painting is about compression. It's about limiting a certain range of value in a certain area that helps, that helps create relationships in ratio. I'm, I'm using big words, so let me, let me see if I can break it down a little bit with, with easier words and digestible words. So you have this very limited range of dark to black to white that's not even anywhere near as close to how vast the range is to dark to light um, in nature. Because of that, we have to compress everything that we see into our range that we are capable of painting. Because of that, we have to compromise some ranges of value um, in order and, and bring them into a closer range in order for everything to fit uh, value-wise in our painting. So um, understanding how to compress things and assign a certain value range to things, for example, this little, this little um, uh, picture here is metallic. I'm compressing it to be slightly darker than normal so that I can create a, a better relationship with its highlights and for it to create separation from the pumpkins. So I'm giving him a lower compression range than other things in the painting. So. Um, but that also applies to maybe the white pumpkin, for example, where I, I kind of group a lot of the lighter lights together, you know, a lot of the lighter lights together in order for um, the pumpkin to stand out as well. It's a very important thing to learn and very difficult. Fine. I know yesterday when we were doing value studies, that is something I struggled with, where I wanted to make everything take up the whole range of values. You know, everything went all the way from white to black. Mm. Yeah, it's easy to do. Our eye wants to focus in certain areas. That's why squinting down helps, because it helps separate the light values from the dark values a little bit more and helps group them in your visual. It's actually another reason why painting with a limited palette or a eye palette is so helpful because you are forced to compress mm -hmm. to some extent with, you can only, like Lewis said, you can only go so dark and so light with your paint and nature has infinity. So you have to make choices of what to include and what not to include, what to group together and what to uh, bring forward. And so, um, this is another example of how, or another, like that's why, for example, you do grisaille before you start going into full color and then, mm -hmm. you know, everything like that. So. Yeah. Um, I, for me, uh, compression was such a difficult, like I understood logically <laughs> what my instructors were saying, but I found it such a challenging thing to do in, when in painting, it took me a long time to understand how to actually put it into practice. Mm. But I think there's a really cool, you know, not just optically or, you know, how to make the drawing look realistic. There's not, it's not just that component. There's something really um, maybe intuitive or psychological or emotional, one, you know, in terms of how you make your choices and what information is important to you and things like that, that can help you make those decisions on what to compress and what to break apart. And so, for example, um, looking at the setup, I'm, I'm going to compress all my darks so that way the really interesting light and textures and, and uh, value relationships variety that I see in the light, I want that to come through and that, and in order for that to come through, I have to compress my darks. And so, um, I can't have too much information in my darks. Too much information meaning detail or breaking up, 
breaking values up, uh, you know, overseeing reflected lights, et cetera. I don't want to have too much of that uh, broken up because then it'll take away from all the interesting things that I want to include in the light. And so you have to make decisions like that. But I think it's also an opportunity because you know, if you have to choose some information over others, then you get to show your thoughts. You, have to, you get to show yeah. what, what you care about and what you think is beautiful. And that way, you're revealing that to, um, to a viewer versus just kind of copying everything. So I think there's like both the technical reason to do it and the beautiful reason to do it. Mm. Agreed. And that's, I think, the benefits of learning the technical aids in the beautiful part. They should absolutely feed into each other. Mm. Esteban is wondering if we have any specific ways of practicing compression. Any suggestions? Yeah, so what I was saying yesterday is that's one of the reasons why our training was in graphite at, um, at my atelier that I learned is because it allows for us to, if you're using graphite, you can't get that dark. And so you can take, we would, I mean, the darkest pencil we would use is an HB. And so um, you make that your shadow value color. And, you know, it's much darker in real life than what you see, but you learn how to use that darkness to your advantage and then you have to compress everything within that range. Um, and so that's one way. And also when you're painting or, or, or drawing or anything, really good way is to start with your shadow value. And I usually make the shadow value a little lighter than my, um, than my utensil or my tool can go. So if my HB pencil has a certain darkness that's really, really, really dark, then I'll go slightly lighter than that. Um, and then that way it allows me for the tiniest amount of extra range if I wanted to do something for a core shadow or something later. So that's why I, I do that. But good question. It is a good question. And thank you. That was informative. It is, I remember drawing in the atelier doing cast drawings. Uh, the temptation was to want to go as dark as you could with the pencils, but I would dig in the paper too much and it would get shiny. So it was a good, a good mm. reason not to want to push it. Yeah, that that old burnishing of burnishing effect that happens with a pencil, <laughs> where you you push all the fibers down so much that it ends up making it like a shiny silvery sort of a gun barrel sil silver color. Exactly. I did not have the discipline to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Another way um, you can learn, for example, or practice, I will say, uh, value compression um, is doing copies, whether it's in paint or drawing. Um, for example, in Florence County, uh, we did bar drawings to, uh, to begin our studies. And it was for the purpose of learning the language of drawing and painting. And you learn what a compressed shadow shape looks like when you have to copy it. And you think about, and you, and you actually have to practice seeing, okay, how gentle can I go with my mm. uh, transitions, how subtle can I make these shifts? How do I create a soft edge? How do I, like, what is, what is a compressed shadow shape? Like, how, how does that even look like mm. in, in a drawing? And so mm -hmm. uh, doing, doing copies is also a very useful thing to do. Some good thoughts. Ellen says, thank you, that makes sense. Um, would you use a wider range or less compressed for more emphasis? Um, what I think people don't realize is, is um, by compressing something, you can create better emphasis. 
So if I compress my pumpkin to be the lightest thing in the, in the painting, and I compress everything in it to being lighter, all of a sudden the emphasis really is on that pumpkin, you know. Um, and that same is true if you have a really light painting, but then you make one thing slightly darker than everything else in the painting, uh, and you compress it to being darker. All of a sudden, you've got a, a cool, re a really awesome relationship that says this is the most important thing you should look at, and that's, I'm emphasizing this, you know. So for those reasons, it's, it's very important. Um, Okay, well, it looks like everyone, we're gonna have to have Erica off the screen for a little bit. One of my cameras is acting up, but I'm gonna let it charge the battery because I think it's because the battery has gone out. So we're gonna let it rest for a second. And you will still be able to hear, but her lovely face will, will you'll just have to, that's gonna be our- um, They're gonna miss my, all my squinting. Yeah. <laughs> my black mirror usage. Um, I think what's going to happen is um, that's going to be like the cliffhanger that makes people stay. There, is, to, go. is to see, <laughs> is to get to see your face again. Oh, you guys. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make a, a relationship of what's gonna be the value color of the front of the face, of the front of the front of the face. <sighs> you can tell I paint portraits. Um, of the front of the pumpkin to the back of the pumpkin and trying to create a bit of a warm, cool relationship with that, but also making sure that I'm keeping everything keyed really high. Awesome. Stephanie says, quoting Paul Cree, Paul Cree said, now the painting looks at me. If we are paying attention to the... The still life, the drawing, the painting, tell us how dark light it wants our drawing to be. Mm. It's a nice thought. This is a nice thought. Ooh, on the topic of Erica's Black Mirror, I know we were talking about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, we were. I was recommending people. You were talking about my Black Mirror? I was talking about your Black Mirror. And I was saying that you were clever and, and found a welding mask uh, glass oh, yeah, and used just, that yeah. as, the, mm -hmm. as your mirror. It's just, it's just a welding lens. <laughs> yeah, it showed up a bit in the beginning. I saw it a few times. If you were paying attention, audience, hopefully we can see Erica again and we can see it used in action. That's right. I put tape all yeah. over it to make sure <laughs> if I drop it, it doesn't shatter into a million pieces. Stay tuned for Erica and her glass. <laughs> so much hype for the, for the black mirror. Wait, Erica, will you hold it up again? Sure. Oh. But isn't that how news broadcasters do it? They're like, stay tuned to hear what character, what, what actor that was on Harry Potter died recently, which is one of the things that was up there, and they were using it for every cliffhanger for like the next five commercial oh my breaks. Gosh. And it's like, we're, we'll be back, and you'll hear, you know, who did the, and you know, then you're like, oh, you know, it was, sadly, it was the actor who played Dumbledore, but... Uh -huh. um, it was one of those things where I was like, come on, guys, really? Are you you're going to make us, you're using, using this, this yeah. using someone's death Exploiting to keep, keep people watching.
We have someone asking what shade of glass, but I think more generally, like what is a black mirror? So black mirror, it's just because welding glass, in order, when you're looking at, when you're welding, you need a lot of <laughs> protection for your eyes. And so that's why it's basically just something dark that's reflective. And this was like $7 from mm. Home Depot. Um, so I used my iPhone screen for a while, but I just didn't want to have to keep like using my phone all the time for things. And so um, but anything that's dark and reflective. The reason you use a black mirror is because it does the compression that we were talking about earlier. It basically squints for you and also flips the image like a normal mirror. And it's so useful because basically it gets rid of all the color and all the details. You just see the big impression of, uh, of what's happening in the setup. So you're looking at all of that beautiful unity, that connectivity, how shadow shapes flow into each other, how values are connected. And it's just a really useful tool. So it combines squinting and the mirror. Perfect, perfect. So yes. Uh, dark, dark glass, darker the better. Is yep. what we could say? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how are you guys deciding what is warm and what is cool? Is it more mm. what you see or is there a thinking behind it beyond just how the light hits your eyes? Is it logical or is it intuitive? You can go ahead and start and I'll... Okay. Well, I think there's two trains of thought to, to use it for. One is you can say, make things that are in the light that are being revealed warm or cool, and then make the opposite of that in the shadow uh, as a harmonious relationship. However, um, in this instance, I've got a lot of warm, cool relationships already happening with the local color of everything. Local color basically means what is the actual color of the object if you were to put it in even light. And um, because of that, um, I am using the warm, cool relationships of the objects themselves to inform my decisions of what should be warmer and cooler and making a hierarchy of warm and cool relationships within the painting. And, and, and in a way, it's gonna make it feel more colorful towards what the painting actually, what the objects actually look like if I do it that way. But if I had like just a bunch of styrofoam cups and you know, white cloth and, you know, monochromatic things, then I would end up making the light as the informant of, of warm or cool and then make the opposite of that in the shadows. So those are, those are two separate ways that you can use a warm, cool relationship. And so I'm doing a more of like constructed way of approaching it, um, meaning, I'm, I'm looking more at what's happening in the setup and then using the tendencies of what warm and cool do to construct my relationships. And so I'm looking at value primarily, but then I'm also using the temperature to, for example, push something forward or make something recede. And so the way I was taught was I generally go warm, cool, warm, cool in this neutral studio lighting. So I have warm shadows, cool midtones, warm lights, and cool highlights. And then I also observe how, how warm things tend to come forward and cool things tend to recede. And so I'm keeping all of those things in mind um, in addition to value relationships to help construct my painting. Beautiful. Beautiful thoughts. And I like there, there are some variety in ways you can approach it. 
Jolyn comments, she just signed up for your courses. Oh, our courses. wonderful. The biggest reason is that you can tell that you have a great passion for teaching the arts. All this great content is amazing with oh, a heart. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we deeply appreciate your patronage. We, we, um, we work very, very hard to make sure that you have, people have this uh, content available to them. Um, and we, um, you know, there, there's a lot of cost and expense, time. I mean, the girls know how much time I, I spend doing this. I, I, I spend a lot of time making sure that we, we can get this up for you guys. Uh, we want to do as much as we can for free for people to have something. But it is always deeply appreciated because what makes us exist is the, is the platform um, and the patrons that we have on that platform. So uh, your support helps sustain East Oaks, and we deeply appreciate you for doing that because it'll allow the people who can't afford it around the world to be able to, to also watch some of the things that we do for free in addition. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Benjamin is wondering how many bushes do you all have in place so far? How many brushes? How many brushes are you guys using? I am. I have only used two so far. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> Erica, let's hold it up again. Not all. This one I haven't used, and this one I haven't used. But I've used. I have five right now. The claw is coming together. Yeah, the exactly. claw. The claw. That's what we call it around here. I always think of that scene from Toy Story. Mm. A little earlier. Yeah, the claw. <laughs> I always think of liar, liar, because that was how he played with his son. He would always come out with and tickle him with his hand, and he would call it the claw. I remember that movie. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good one. Mary Brett Beth is asking, are you folks using bristle brushes? What kind of brushes? Uh, right now, I'm using an old Michael Klein Rosemary Series 201 brush. Uh, it's a... It's a number 10, but I very well could be using, um, you know, I have a, a couple of hog's hair brushes here too. This one is an ivory long filbert. Um, and then I have a natural hair from, from Silver Brush uh, that they so generously gave me. And um, they're really great for laying on lots of paint. So when it comes to Later on, I, I might switch over and use one of those, but I have a hard time sometimes um, switching up brushes. I, I get one I like and I start working with it a bit. Um, I'm using a combination. I'm using right now, this is a uh, bristle filbert from Rosemary, and I like it a lot because um, I can scrub in and be really, um, I can cover a lot. I can scrub things in and kind of move the paint around a lot and leave some texture behind too, um, meaning it doesn't have to be too opaque and things can be quite soft at the beginning, um, which allows me to then, when things are soft, then once I get the lay in, then I can start specifying and clarifying once I'm secure and where I'm going. Um, and so this brush, or Starting out with something soft is useful for me. Uh, and then I'm using, I use this flat to help scrub in some of my background. Same with this uh, Robert Simmons Signet uh, bristle brush. This one is a flat, yep. Yeah. And I like these a lot too. I've had these since my Florence Academy days, so it's, they're quite durable, which I enjoy. Um, and again, I like to use them at the beginning for you know scrubbing things around, and then later when I'm want, when I want to maybe fill in some other information, I'll use my rosemary sables. Um, this is a spotter, which is for I use a lot when I'm painting flowers, and I like it a lot. Um, it tends to kind of create a nice shape that I tend to paint when I'm painting flowers, and so because that's what I have here, it's what I've grabbed. Um, also, a uh, so sable filbert is also really versatile, so I like both. 
Do you do you guys have any general rules for when you would use like bristles or hard hairs versus like soft hairs? Um, I don't know if there are necessarily rules, but there are definitely things that they can help with, um, and it's good to know. So, for example, a lot of people think that something that was a kind of a, an epiphany for me is that um, a lot of people believe that soft hair brushes create soft edges, and hard brushes create hard edges. Now, you can make soft edges with a soft brush, and you can make hard edges with a hard brush, but you can use a hard, a bristle brush um, much more easily to soften an edge. Say, for example, let's just take this edge here, for example, and I wanted to soften it. I could use this bristle brush that's dry and go over it and go over it again, and it will soften that edge for me. Um, so they work really well when you're wanting to like soften two hard edges together as like a welding device. Um, so they're really great for that. And if I wanted to do a hard edge, I can use a dark, I can use, you know, a soft brush and go in and make the edge harder again. Um, if there was an area that I wanted a really clean line or a clean edge on it. So that it also just comes down to knowing your brush well enough to know how to control it. And that, that's why we have a hard soft brush day is because we are gonna be talking about just that. A thing to look forward to, everybody stay tuned. <laughs> that's right. I wonder who will be doing that day, Lewis and who. Everybody's paintings looking beautiful so far. Ben Thank you. Benjamin is wondering if you ever lose dexterity in your hand holding your brushes that way, Erica. Any concerns? <laughs> <laughs> I will say when I was holding my palette and my brushes, and like back in the day we used to use a handheld palette, um, the intensity of the model room and <laughs> wanting to do well in my drawing, um, I would, or in my painting, I'd you know, after the 25 minute session, you know, before the break, then I would like have to unclaw my <laughs> hand from the palette and <laughs> get the dent in from the, from the palette and on my thumb. <laughs> but uh, not yet, I'll say I haven't experienced any issues yet, but you know, we'll see what happens. My yeah. arthritis kicks in too early. <laughs> now we'll know why. There's, like, I know that they're built so that way you can hold them like this, and then that way the tops don't touch each other. That's why they're tapered, and you know, that's how they're built, but they just, just never end up using it like that. <laughs> it's too, too convenient. Exactly. Painting isn't hard enough, so you just like add some tension. Right. Anybody who might be doing art alongside us today, I'm wondering how that's going. Is everybody still lives doing well? Commissions going well? Mm -hmm. Having a good art day? Yeah, I'm interested to hear. Yeah, tell us how it's going. It will be exciting to see this setup done a la prima tomorrow. Yeah. All the colors, it's been like a gradual buildup. That's true, it has.
Mm, it's gotten really quiet all of a sudden. We're ready for some of those dad joke, art dad jokes that uh, we're having earlier. Yeah, dad jokes. We did get a couple responses. Benjamin's having a bad art day, so he's taking a nap and watching us. Hey, well, I, I'm glad we're here for you. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes that's just what you got to do. Sometimes it just doesn't flow, so you take a nap. <laughs> yep, exactly. Stephanie is drawing with a mechanical pencil on yellow sticky notes, but she's looking forward to getting out the paints in a panel. Nice. Mm. Bethany comments, I like how you have the playlist set up on YouTube in advance so she can anticipate what's coming that day. More fun than a calendar. Hey. Hey. That's awesome. Um, well, we, we have both. So you, for the people that are calendar people, we got that. And the people that are uh, playlist people, we got that. Mm. And where do people go to find the calendar? If they want the calendar, there should be a link in each description of exactly where to find that calendar. Um, so you should be able to find it there. Beautiful, beautiful. Mary Beth is procrastinating on a portrait painting. <laughs> she says, I should be finishing, but instead I am watching this and getting inspired. Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm glad we're here for your procrastination. Um, I, I have a deep appreciation for a lot of YouTube videos for helping me procrastinate when I need to <laughs> and justifying it as education. It is education sometimes. <laughs> oh, it absolutely is. I, most of the stuff I watch is education. It's just I watch far too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you have to actually put that education to use to yep. practice or else it's just knowledge that never yep. goes anywhere. But exactly. We're glad you're joining us, Mary Beth. And Benjamin has come in with a joke. You know why Soviet skaters skated so fast? They're Russian. Yeah, they're Russian. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I spent a lot of time on this guy, but he's kind of, I don't know, he's my lead star, so I'm just kind of playing around with him, making sure that he's got some interesting relationships happening. Making all these neutrals. It's kind of like once you get the relationships down, then I kind of go in and I'll even push the color, warm, cool relationships even more. I do really enjoy that pumpkin. It has a very interesting shape. It does, doesn't it? Mm. Wider ridges. What would you even call those? Than they like they definitely have a species name. I, I'm not sure what it is. I should have asked before I took it so that I could sound smart. But um, yeah, it's just an awesome pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of looks like a four-leaf clover. <laughs> kind of does. I can see that. Okay, that's a thing. Eris, Erica is pretty good at the puns sometimes. Maybe if we'll get lucky, we'll hear one. <laughs> A good Ericaism. An Ericaism. I did come up with East Oaks Yeah, she sure did. <laughs> she sure did, and we ran with it. We're like, that's awesome. Let's call it East Oaks Tober. 
Another score for Erica. Can't stop her. That's right. It's fine because I want to keep making this even more of a yellowish relationship. This whole pumpkin. Make it even more warm. But to do that, I'll have to bring down the whole value of the whole pumpkin. I'm a firm believer, Michael used to say this, is that whatever you put down is going to be wrong. And I know that sounds harsh, but he, what he was basically putting, saying is, feel at liberty to just go ahead and put stuff down, because no matter what you put down, you're going to have to adjust it to some degree. So just have the boldness to get it down. And I've always loved that, because uh, it helps me go, I don't have to have the perfect stroke yet. I just need to get something down for context. And if it doesn't work, I can readjust and adapt really well. Hmm. Sometimes it's good to not be so precious in the beginning. Mm -hmm. As if it's going to change anyways. That's right. Don't put forever into it and get too attached. Don't put forever into it. I like that. See, now we're getting closer to the right value range where I can actually add a little more warmth to it. And so I don't know if y'all noticed, but I switched over to also try transparent oxide yellow with manganese, violet, and cobalt blue. And they also make a beautiful, very lovely neutral color. So um, I'm just using it to make the pumpkin slightly warmer and slightly lower in value so that I have um, a bit more <clears throat> warm, cool relationship with the rest of the painting. Bethany chimes in. She says she thinks the pumpkins, the sections of the pumpkins are called lobes, answering my question. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, she likes pumpkins for still lifes because they have a lot of interesting shapes and colors, but less complicated than flowers and stay fresh forever. And I, I like that about pumpkins too. So I'm not the fastest painter. <laughs> flowers. Whew. Yeah. Um, Erica is our flower master here. She's the one that um, paints a lot of ala prima flowers, but she also paints um, indirectly uh, flowers as well. She just got done doing an indirect painting of orchids, and then, and uh, but today in the last in the day before, I think you were doing some ala prima ones of roses, mm -hmm. right? I always learn so much from doing them. I learned from every painting, but something about flowers. Yep. Lewis 
Chris, do you think doing a value study yesterday of the same subject has helped you at all with today's Chris I? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think it. I think that's the whole reason we're doing this is because I think it it uh, it can aid every day can aid the next day. Um, well, that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Erica's the underdog today. Yeah, she's she's coming in fresh. No worries. You got it, girl. I mean, I'm thinking of this as like a study, as a way of reminding myself what my priorities are. Hmm. I feel like our audience is quieter today, too. Let's see if I can put, let me just put a few more shifts notes. I'm going to make the background just slightly cooler. Why am I going to the black? I'm going to keep going here. So the wonderful thing I love about painting with these color relationships is you can create these like nice, cool, warm, warm and cool vibrational moments that are happening. And so like, for example, if I want this background to be a bit cooler, not as cold as the front, but I want it to be a bit cooler, if I then make it slightly lighter and warmer as it gets closer to the pumpkin, it'll actually make the pumpkin, illusion-wise, feel warmer. And just lift a bit more of the paint up. So I might just use this brush. And then go in with a bit more blue. Ian asks, are we going to be taking this into the color stage in the next video? And I do believe that is the plan. It, yes, uh, we're not going to take the exact painting uh, because it's going to be an a la prima. So we'll be painting into the wet. But this is, this is basically an exercise for everyone to try to see if they can do just a tiny bit of limited color palette and, and play with the idea of warms and cools in it. So, hmm. same subject, new painting. Yep. In color, though. Beautiful. Today is a little bit like dipping your toes in before like the full jump tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because uh, I don't think people do this enough. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I'm wanting to do it is that I just don't think that people give themselves the opportunity to, and so this is your excuse to, to make it happen. I'm trying to make a little bit of broken color relationships happen up here. All right, that's enough on him for the moment. I'm going to just make a few tweaks and then move on to Mr. Pumpkin number two. Awesome. 
Awesome. Sometimes you just have to have trust the process and just keep covering, and then you can always adjust, just like we were talking about earlier, with needing to put something down in order to know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you just need to cover, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> just got to cover. <laughs> so. How are you feeling about it right now, Erica? Better than I was half an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. So. Sometimes patience is key, you know? Uh, you can't see the end product when you just start, but you've got to have a little faith that you'll get there. That's right. I had a teacher say once, it doesn't get any easier. You just do like you learn how to deal with it better. <laughs> Yep. And I loved it. Bethany says this warm, cool, neutral approach reminds me of what things look like at night when the light is real low. Ooh, yeah, kind of a moon A lot of lit. natural compression happening. Yeah. yeah. I do like that time of day. Yeah, um... Because our night vision, the rods in our eyes are don't have color perception, so they only see light and dark, and so um, our cones can't see as much color going on. So that's um, yeah, it's a cool phenomenon. Cool, get it? I was going to say pun intended. <laughs> it's one of those things I, I realized later. Like, should I say it? Should I not? I didn't follow my own rule. I should have said it. <laughs> you should have said it. <laughs> yep, see? I've been see? waiting for the jokes. I don't know. I'm, that... sure, I'm sure there'll be more <laughs> opportunities. Gotta say them, Erica. I know. Can't be shy. Stephanie is letting us know the pumpkin is a flight, flat white bower pumpkin. Bower pumpkin, there we go. Cucurbita maxima. I maybe said that right. Cucur, cucurbita. Mm. So maybe we'll call him Jack Bower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For anyone who was used to watch 24 back in the day. Jack, Jack Bower, Jack Bower. Anybody? Don't know that one. Yep. Erica does, though. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I bet you and your dad watched it together. Here's a fact. Most pumpkins have between three and seven lobes, but there are exceptions. Huh. Um, some French pumpkins, uh, the Cinderella pumpkin, have more than seven lobes and are very flat and wide. Very nice. That is very nice. Learning more than just art stuff. What is that, like botany? Yeah. Botany. Yeah, botany would be one of the fields. Mm, Sue is wondering if we'll be adding colors to uh, the grisaille after October. Um, we are going to be making a color one version tomorrow, um, but no. In fact, sometimes I like, if, if you do it right, it, they're really beautiful in and of themselves. So um, I'm hoping that it turns out and it's just a lovely painting in its own right. Might yes. be even one of those things that I keep painting on after we're done just for the heck of having a pretty warm, cool relationship painting. I know that it's part of some people's um, process is to paint a grisaille and then paint over it mm -hmm. in color. Mm. I don't know. I don't necessarily do it that deliberately or, or not deliberately, that um, uh, in such a fixed way where I'm like, I have to paint a grisaille and then I paint on top of it. But I definitely consider that in my underpainting stages of figurative or portraiture work where I'm limiting my colors and creating mm -hmm. certain relationships, just because it's easier to see than if it's tr a true monochromatic underpainting. 
I can go ahead and create some temperature shifts and I can help things come forward or recede as you want them yeah. and then paint on top of them. But it's not necessarily like as um, like pure grisaille as what I'm doing right now. But it, it can be very helpful. We have a joke from the audience playing into nice. Stephanie's comment about Cinderella pumpkin. Jonathan says, why couldn't Cinderella play football? Because she had a pumpkin for a coach. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad it's lot. good. Keep it coming. <laughs> oh, man. I'll, I'll take the bad jokes all day. Just keep it coming. Love it. Here's a question. As professionals, how often do you paint just for practice? Not enough, honestly. Um, what I, I would probably, I would probably say that um, at least as a, as a professional, it's hard to start finding time to to practice when you're when you're kind of get in the world of orders or solo shows or getting stuff ready for shows, you know, group shows and things like that, that it's it's really hard to to start carving out time for you to continue to learn. And so what ends up happening is is that your every painting I do, and this is the, honestly this is a Pixar method. This is what they would say too uh, with their field is. Every painting I work on, I, I try to experiment with something new. It could be a new color. It could be the idea of edge work. It could be any of the exercises we're talking about today, I might incorporate in a new, in, in one of my paintings. So, um, so for that reason, um, I would say that um, I practice every day that I pick up the brush, but uh, for the intentional purpose of soul practice, probably need to do it more often and wish I could. I need to manage my time better to do so. And it, that's one of the reasons why I'm having so much fun doing this with everyone is because this forces me to have intentional practice, to do something different that I've always wanted to try that I didn't try before. Um, some of these, have, you know, were common practice when I was learning, but some of these are brand new that I've never done, and I'm really excited about trying them. Like the impostor syndrome day, and squeezing out a whole a half a tube of, of paint of each color. I'm really looking forward to doing that, because um, that is not in my practice. That one I'll give credit to Dan for that idea. Mm -hmm. Um, he had the fourth years when I was like, I think it was the second year when I heard about this. But anyway, he had the fourth years at the time do, like he gave them large piles of paint and like it was his paint too. So like nobody had to feel like they um, needed to be cautious about how much they used or mm. to reserve it for mm -hmm. later, you know, that kind of thing. So um and with the purpose of just being free with, with paint and, and comfortable to use as much as you wanted to and to use it all up and play with impasto and things like that. So that was a really cool idea. Yeah, it is a great idea. To kind of echo what you're saying, I find about um, learning or you know, doing deliberate um, deliberate exercises in, in your painting rather than, all right, like keep continuing to learn. I'll say that every painting, I'm, I'm always learning in every yeah. painting. And I think part of it is like, is a mindset of approaching each painting um, with, with like the curiosity mindset and with, it, with we're not coasting. I find that, or going on autopilot, like anytime you're, you're creating a painting, you're always engaging with the subject, you're always you know, critiquing yourself and seeing you know, what works, what doesn't, how can I make this better, how can I make this more interesting, 
And I think part of that goes into, like when you're, if you're not doing a deliberate academic exercise, like you don't have to do deliberate academic mm. exercises in order to continue to improve. I think mm -hmm. part of it is just keep, keep engaging with your own work and asking yourself questions about how you can make it more interesting and keep researching. Well said. All right, let's get over to this guy. See if I can make a nice medium ton. This is going to be a fun guy because he's a bit cooler in relationship to everything else. Um, how is everyone enjoying these live streams being earlier in the day? Let me know. Because um, we've, I think I've really enjoyed having them a little bit earlier in the day, and I think it helps probably our audience a little bit too. So let us know. Maybe we'll do some of the painting from lives a little bit earlier in the day sometime in the months to come as a way of just changing things up a little bit. You know, East Oaks, we're, we're trying always to figure out ways to, to help connect with our audience and easier ways for them to connect with us. And I had one of my, uh, one of the avid viewers come approach me at Portrait Society and they were like, you know, I'm, I love them, but I have to get up in the middle of the night because I like live in Australia to watch them and I was just wondering if you'd ever do them you know, at a different time so that I, it might be a little easier for me to get a chance to see everybody. I was like, you know what, we'll, we'll, I'm going to throw that one in the, in the suggestion box, see if we can do that in the future. I don't know about y'all, but also changing subjects, I love fall. It's like my favorite, one of my favorite seasons, it's fall and spring. Um, what is your favorite season and why? Uh, one of my reasons I love fall so much is because we were talking about this earlier. You know, guys don't have a lot of opportunity to accessorize. And I love scarves. And I like wearing them a lot. And, um, and I love the cold. So I feel like I can pull out some of my long sleeves because I get hot really easily. And so it's like the first time I get a chance to wear something different than what I normally do. So... What about you? What do you like to do? We do have a few comments. June says, I feel the need to step away for a few minutes and take a break, do, 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 but I think this stream is great and so helpful. I appreciate your doing this for us. Oh, you're welcome. Stephanie says, this time on Tuesdays is perfect for me. Thank you. Cool. And then we have another joke uh, from Benjamin. Why should you never play poker with a cow eating cannabis? Because the stakes are too high. <laughs> oh, man. These are like brutally bad that I can't stop myself from laughing. Because the stakes are too high. I have to share them. Some good fall <laughs> accessories, though, are the best. Sweaters. It's weather weather coming up. Sweater weather. Got your scarves. You got your hats. You can bring out the beanies. You can bring out the hats that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Grandpa hats. Yeah, the gran they call them the grandpa hats. We called them cabbie hats. Cabbie hats. Yeah. Beautiful choice. Does anybody in the audience wear cabbie hats? Is that what it's called? <laughs> 
Yeah, that'd be awesome. I want to get one. They're handsome. Well, I have some upstairs. You want to try one on? <gasps> I don't even have to buy it. You don't even have to buy it. Try before you buy. <laughs> the both paintings are really coming together. Slowly, slowly. Chipping away at the second pumpkin, Lewis. Mm -hmm. How are Just, we on time? <laughs> uh, we have three minutes. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> are we, yeah. are we, we doing are, around three hours? We're going to do a three hour one, so we have an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes left. Oh, okay. So, yeah. You're safe. Well. Stephanie says, I love the pure, more horizontal light of autumn starting about the 1st of October. Mm. Familiar objects change their appearance, too. Mm -hmm. I agree. I like the light when the sun is lower in the sky. It's different. I I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, the only thing I say I don't like about winter and, and uh, is the shorter days, because I do love being outside on a sunny, funny a sun a sunny fun day. A sunny funny day. Yeah, I agree with you. I like how each season has something great to offer. You know, mm. mm -hmm. you got the sun in the summer and the long days, and then the colors of the fall, and it starts to get crisp, but like not too cold yet, just crisp. Yeah. Can take nice walks. And then winter is good for huddling up. Yeah. Shutting inside, wearing pajamas, and drinking oh, yeah. warm no. beverages. Fall now baking, oh. like apple things. Yes, yeah. Pastries. <laughs> Pumpkins. Get the spices I don't object to any of that. You can do them all in my oven. <laughs> <laughs> you have to leave a bit, though. That's like oh, the I'm not toll. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> nope. We did last year do a Christmas get together. Uh, I don't know if you call them parties or get togethers, but they're always parties for me. Um, <laughs> And we decorated Christmas cookies, and Erica brought over some of her delicious, delicious baking. It was awesome. I have heard about Erica's baking, but I have not the yet legend. had it. The legend of the bake. The legendary baking skills. I don't know. I just really like pastries. So. Not just the painter, folks. She is multifaceted. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. Everybody better watch it out. Has, it has turned into my creative hobby that's not painting. Which is good to have non-painting hobbies. When your profession is what most people consider a hobby, yeah, you, you need another hobby. <laughs> yeah. It is absolutely true. Speaking of hobbies, I was just thinking about earlier how I miss playing the piano. 
Oh, well, no. we have a keyboard. We'll bring it down for you. <gasps> you bring it downstairs? Yeah. Ah, because I couldn't bring my Nofer in the move. It's too big. Too well, big. We'll bust it out and we'll put, we'll put some, we'll, we'll have you uh, during Halloween play some fun piano music for everybody coming to Trick or Treat. <laughs> I have to learn some new songs. <laughs> Get in the mood. Like, this is Halloween. This is Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That'd be cool. <laughs> Nightmare Before Christmas. We were talking about this yesterday. My wife and I, we do Disney Halloween. We, we, we aren't like horror people. We don't get into the, like the super scary. We, we do about Disney scaries, about as scary as we go. <laughs> so, Nightmare Before Christmas counts as one of our movies we'll watch. Looking forward to it. Um, here in, from Jer, Jer says, here in Colombia, there's not seasons. We live in something like an eternal spring all the time. Wow. Awesome. Do, you, um, do you have a dry and a wet season? I know most people who don't have seasons usually will have a dry and wet. quickly pull some of the paint off after I get this down. Too bad. The reason I kind of go over my drawing lines is because then I can carve into it and make a soft edge. On the back side of the pumpkin, in this case. Gail has returned from her visit with the contractor. She's wondering, what does Lewis have on his palette now? I have um, transparent oxide red and yellow, and then I have um, French or ultramarine blue. I always want to say French ultramarine because that was always the first one I bought when I was younger. Uh, cobalt blue and um, manganese violet and white, and I'm just kind of mixing them all to be more neutral and just shifting the neutrality of them warm, warm and cool. Let's put a little bit of a stock in here. Stephanie's telling us how she's doing. She's carefully using the eraser of her mechanical pencil to pull out some of the lights and highlights, which I think is always the funnest part, or most fun. Mm -hmm. Most fun. <laughs> yeah. That is one of the most fun. You got this, Stephanie. And Jer says, yes, exactly. There's the rainy season and the sunny season, but they are so irregular that it becomes one, <laughs> at least for me. Yep.
Well, stay dry, my friend. I'm going to shift this guy just slightly more blue and cool in its relationships. I want to know how you guys are using your warm and cool relationships. Are you taking an Erica approach, a bit of a warm, cool, warm, cool? You take in more of a me approach where you're observing the local color of the, the object. Are you using it as a certain range of color or warm in the shadow and cool in the light or vice versa? What is a way that feels like a challenge for you to try? So not too long from now, I'm working on trying to get us some little bit of music so that that won't take us off of YouTube. And YouTube has new like music features. So I'm really looking forward to playing around with them. They probably have had them for a while, but it, I'm just now aware of them. So where is royalty free? music that people can use. So I'm going to try to add that to the experience of our audience. Always like the look, the unified look that a limited palette brings. Mm. Something that you want to create harmony in your paintings. Limiting your palette can help. It's not a guarantee that you'll <laughs> that you'll have color harmony. You need to think about why something is harmonious, but it is one way to start getting into uh, adding that to your thought process. Yeah. Totally. On the topic of warm and cool, Gail says, I don't remember who mentioned color blindness yesterday, but part of what I learned from Seth Haverkamp about how he copes with his red green color blindness is by focusing on warm and cool. That's an mm. interesting fact. You know that? Yeah, that's cool. That is, that's really cool. I didn't know that Seth Haverkamp was uh, colorblind or to whatever degree he may be. Interestingly, color blindness is much more common in men than it is in women. Yeah, and I think uh, women can only get a certain level of severity, if I remember correctly. Uh, men can get, you know, there are versions that are almost in totality, but women don't have that. Women also can be tetrachromates, which is really wild. Mm, I was just about cool. to say that. You like an extra cone. Yep, get Bonus. that extra color cone, which is super cool. Uh, female superpower for those who have it. Perks. <laughs> perks. Hashtag perks. <laughs>
now that I'm kind of like getting some of this. So up here, I'm going to just shift a little of these things a little warm and cool. Make it in the light. I'm wondering for either of you, is there any part of the painting that you're especially struggling with or finding a little bit more difficult than the rest? Um, I can't relate. Can't relate. It's all easy. <laughs> no. Um, part of it is right now, in general, because things are transparent and thin, it, it, like, it looks nice, but then I want to add more opacity, but then when you add opacity, then it cools things down. So you have to be aware of what's happening when mm. you play with the, text, with the thickness and thinness of the paint, but I don't mm -hmm. want my painting to all be thin, and so that's something that I could work through where I could be more um, confident in adding thicker paint in certain places. Mm. Mm. Which usually isn't my problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that there are areas that are, that are taking longer than I suspected they would take. Um, and more, that's more so because maybe I'm focusing too, too much on them at this moment. Um, but just playing, there, this pumpkin over here has all sorts of warm, cool local relationships that are interesting. And I'm trying to play with some of those relationships, but making sure that they aren't overpowering, but they also make it understood and that that can be, that can be a challenge. I also am working on these kind of crinkly dried leaves over here, and they're not reading as being that in my painting, so I <laughs> need to make sure that when I'm painting the object that you can tell what it is, mm. this particular one. One thing that's playing into my painting is um, my imprimatura. The stain of my canvas is a little bit warm. And so when I paint over it, everything looks cold. And so, mm -hmm. which isn't a bad thing necessarily, but it is playing into my perception of warm and cool. Yep. Yeah, I had that issue earlier when I was working on uh, a bit of the painting is that the, the tone of my canvas was a bit warmer and it was playing into everything, even the warm paint that I was putting down because exactly. I'm using titanium felt cold. Mm -hmm. Another reason why kind of like trusting the process <laughs> is yeah. important, just keep covering and don't judge too quickly until you've covered a bit more. And that's what keeping something thin uh, or keeping your underpainting thin and dry can be helpful because then you can mm -hmm. easily paint on top of it. Yep. Oh, 
But one thing that's cool that's happening, interesting I should say, that's happening, is uh, since I'm using raw umber, it dries pretty quickly. And some of this is already tacking up in an interesting way, which means that I can go on top of it and even maybe warm something up because by layering more raw umber on top of it, mm. mm -hmm. I can kind of push my temperature that way. One thing that I think doing um, these more value-based exercises is helpful is that you see how similar so many things are. You see how maybe the value of your background is similar to something in an object. You know, the background and mid-tone maybe are similar. Mm. Or you see how uh, your shadows are similar or how you can group them together. And you get that, um, that abstract continuity within your painting. Um, I, I just think it's it's really fascinating how when you're when painting realistically, there's so much abstract design happening behind it. Yeah. Having fun with this little metal guy, playing with the warm and cool relationships in him. Because he has all sorts of different relationships happening. Arturo has dropped in to say hola from Barcelona. Hello. Hola back. <laughs> Hola. Stephanie has given us a quote. Wesley Carley, ECU School of Art, said, if it doesn't make sense, leave it out. Like yeah, that. yeah, it's good. Sometimes less is more, you know? More doesn't necessarily add to the piece. Absolutely. Let's see if we can push these colors in here. I feel like this is where it gets, starts getting fun for me. Cause I feel like I can start really paying attention to warm and cool, and dark and light a little bit more. Can start pushing things a bit more. Stephanie says, love the way the smaller pumpkin and the ooer are playing a sort of duet. Yeah. Yeah, they're, we're, we're, I'm having fun with these little guys. Took a little while for me to get over to them, but yeah, I'm having a good time with them. I 
I think Uwer was the word of the day yesterday. Really was. I, I really didn't know what, it, what to call it. And then Evie busted it out like, like oh, you know, it was this. Gail is asking what size boards are each of you using? Oh, I'm using 8x10. And I'm using 9x12. Well, there you go. Next question. <laughs> Give us another one. <laughs> Hit me with it. That was a breeze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got this all day. Nailed it. Nailed no. it. <laughs> I get an A, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Alanis is wondering how much time after doing the, the grisside do you have to wait to put more color on top of it if you were to Ooh, do so? That depends on the paint colors you're using. Um, so if I'm using titanium, it might take a bit um, because it takes it's so much longer to dry. But if I were to use, say, um, uh, lead white, then it would take much less time. So um, I, you know, there's colors that I could use that I could be, it could be ready by the next day, depending on the size of the painting and how, how thick the paint was and, you know, lots of variables. But, but yeah, there's, it absolutely could be as quick as soon as the day after and then it could be as easy as, you know, I don't know, uh, about five or six days after. What about you, Erica? If you're using um, raw umber, it'll for sure be dry. Yes, raw umber definitely helps it. <laughs> like it's already drying on mine. Like I had to scrape my palette because it was starting to tack up on wow. my palette. Yeah. I think Stephanie is correcting my pronunciation. So maybe you were? Like you were. You were. <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> Tried my best. There you go. Let's see if I can keep pushing things. I might make a little bit of a dark note there as things kind of go off the side. doing this painting, is there anything that you will take into your professional work? Mm. Anything you've learned from doing this? I, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I always enjoy the freshness of these. And 
and um, and so that's always a nice thing to to consider. But I, I don't, you know, it, nothing's coming to mind at this moment. But I'm sure there is. What about you? Um, I'm always. You know, where I talked before about continuity and shape design, flow, compression, it's all, it, it always just reminds me how important that is. Yeah. And so sometimes the effort to make something more accurate drawing-wise, we get really tight in our vision yeah. mm -hmm. when if you see how things are similar, how things flow with each other, how connected things are, you actually are more likely to be accurate than if you just kind of force in on like getting an angle perfect. Right. Because you're not seeing what it's relating to. So. Yeah. It's it just good. reminds me of that. I like it. It's good. Good thoughts. I, um, something that I do like when I'm doing these kinds of things is because since it is a la prima, I, I find myself making better, fresher marks and being okay with covering up something I just had already done, which is kind of fun. Um, like you're more flexible yep. and like with changing things and... Yep, exactly. Changing things, seeing if something will work, but also realizing, you know, if I keep it fresh by just making sure I add more paint to the whole thing, then it's okay to cover something up because you might just come up with something that works even better. Beth comments, we started this talking about relationships, and that seems to be the takeaway for her. Relationships. Yeah, I'd say that that's yeah. that's majority of painting right there. <laughs> In a way. It's relationships of color, relationships of shape, and scale. Just all around, across the board. Those relationships. All right, I'm going to switch over to a flat for a few spots. Stephanie says, planning to take beautifully calligraphic marks of the corn husks and stem shadows into my next painting. Nice. Oh, awesome.
So I just have to be careful of how much I hum, because then I realize I'm on record and people are hearing me. I hum a lot in the studio, and so all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, that went out to the audience. Glad I'm not uh, verbally processing like my shower thoughts, you know? It's like, hmm. <laughs> if a Smurf held its breath, what color would he turn? It's an important thing to contemplate. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It is. You know? Poor Smurf, how would I know? Somebody's getting a call. It's me. <laughs> Telemarketer. Uh, go away. Our favorite friends, right? forgot about this little guy over here. I hope people are out there taking on the challenge. I need to get on Discord today and see who's putting up what. So it'd be fun to see what y'all are working on. Yes, everybody show us what you got going on. I want to see what you make. So us what you're working with. Do it. Is the link in the description again? Yep, should be. There you go. You guys know how to find it. Get some good conversations going. That's right. Okay, I'm going to see if about shifting the bottom a little more blue or cool, neutral. I need to use a mixer. Give me a palette knife. I 
Oh, let's get Erica's camera back on and see if it'll go. So they can see your beautiful visage. Hey, what's up? Hey, there's Erica, everybody. There she is. Okay, I'm going to try some crazy stuff here. Actually, it won't be crazy at all. <laughs> just, just, what, what are you going to do? Do <laughs> wild. I'm going to just paint over the whole thing. I'm going to finish it off. Just wipe hand. it out. <laughs> Introduce some lime green in there. Yeah, exactly. First of all, I'm going to use that color. Just get some of those accent darks. It's actually it'd be a really good stage to just like make wipe it to make a ghost image and then just like go in with fresh work, fresh marks. Don't tempt me. Do it just to mix things up. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> the nice dark accents. They look good. Yeah, trying to liven it up just a little bit. Get one more set of depth. And then make sure that we soften some of these areas. Okay.
I, my my extroverted brain can't handle it. <laughs> I'm like, like I'm good. <laughs> I like fill the space. People are watching. We gotta like make sure that we're talking. Okay, I'm gonna add some a bit more fun texture. Stephanie is commenting in, discovering with the eraser on my mechanical pencil that the table surface may be shiny enough to be providing some reflected lights on underneath surfaces of large pumpkin and the ewer. Mm. Swapped the handle and the spout on the ewer to create an even livelier duet between it and the back pumpkin, taking some artistic liberties. As you should. Mm -hmm. All those artistic liberties are going to help. Uh, I forgot to put the highlight in the ewer. Let's see if we can put like a fun, cold highlight. In here. And put the biggest, brightest one. And there's like a nice pinky. One at the top. Alyssa so kindly comments, thank you, you brilliant people, for these sessions. So generous. Oh, well, I'm so glad you're enjoying them. Makes it worth it for me to do it. Okay, let's see if I can get some of these. When you said you wish people would do exercises like this more, is there something when you are teaching and seeing like mentees work or something that's uh, suggesting that this kind of exercise would be good? Like, are you seeing something in their work and you're like, that you should go back and do this exercise would be helpful for you? Is mm. there something that you're thinking about that made, that, that made you think it would be helpful? I think, not in particular, I think what um, comes to mind is that so often, like the whole main reason that it was important to me or I thought that it might bring value to people is that um, so many times we are like, oh, that would be a fun exercise, you know, mm -hmm. but we don't realize that, that sometimes when we say that, that there are there are things that it's not just an exercise to be fun, but it actually has a reason for being an exercise, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I think that people uh, don't give themselves the excuse or liberty to do it, or they need um, some sort of push. I feel like you know sometimes it's like you know we need the new year. We could start to like a diet or start to get go do some exercise. Any day, you know, any day would be fine, 
to start that. But um, it sometimes helps our, our human psyche to have something that is a cornerstone for starting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that part of what I'm saying is, is that I'm giving us the liberty to say, you should, you should do it, and it's important to do it now. Let's do it now. Because yeah, now's, now, yeah, now's the time to do it, you know, is the best time to do anything. And, and so part, part of it is, is that heart behind the uh, reason that people, people should do these exercises because they often would, would benefit them in discovering new things that they didn't know that needed to be discovered. Um, and so I think that's part of what... Motivated you to yeah. start this. Yeah. So. Gail was wondering if they can ask an administrative question sure. about inventory. I'm not sure what that is yet. But they were wondering also, would you want to see exercises like these in a portfolio for proof that the artist has some curiosity? Uh, I, that's, that's an interesting question. I think that, um, I think showing a person's ability to do something in versatility, um, is, is a good thing. Um, but if it depends on like who's viewing the portfolio, I think in my head, you know, if you're looking at going to an art school and you're going to like you know, a traditional form of art school, you know, not say like an atelier. I think absolutely having a diversity that shows that you're trying to practice exercises, I think it's, is, is important. Um, but if you're showing it to a client for the purpose of versatility, I have found that clients do not have, do not have a good imagination past what they see. Um, you need something in your portfolio that is exactly what they're going to want done. Um, and so for those reasons, I, th I think that it's good for us to keep in mind that, um, that uh, you just need to know your audience. You know, if, if they understand that it's an exercise, that's one thing, you know. I don't know if this is the best... I did a very good job of answering that question, but um, if I have time to muddle it over a little bit more, maybe I can come up with a better answer. Stephanie suggests Draw, draw, draw. 20 minutes a day. Think of it as a workout. Yeah, that's a great, great thing to do. Yeah, we have this corn stalk back here, and I'm trying to think if, if it's better if I just get rid of it, because it's just not making sense. Yeah. Just going to put some of that pumpkin back there. This is your painting. Make it the way you want to make it. Happy trees. Yeah, Lewis. And play with that highlight on the side there so it feeds this part of the metal.
Gail says their admin question is how to describe location of work in their possession on artwork archive. Should they say artist studio or on hand or dot dot dot? What do you suggest? Uh, Liv, how about, do you, can you summarize that question for me? Like what, what they're, because I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. I think it's about on a website, say you have a painting still with you. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing how you should label it as such, like in your possession. I guess maybe the question is, is it in for stock? sale? Yeah, available. <laughs> available or in stock is what I would say. Um, is what I see most often. Let's put it that way. Erica, you have a thought? Um, I actually haven't come up, have had the op I haven't had that situation come up where I've needed to declare that. Yeah. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, I, I would just put in stock um, just because I think most websites like Squarespace and places like that tend to have it written that way. Mm -hmm. They say they're creating a label, but I guess it would depend on what the label is for. Like, who are you describing this to and what's the purpose of it? Mm. Love seeing the paintings unfold. Erica, I like seeing how you do the little kettle. That was oh. an interesting one for me to paint. <laughs> that was a bit stressful <laughs> for me. There was a point where I was working on the spout. I was like, that's not working. So when in doubt, scrub it out. <laughs> When in doubt, it. scrub it out. <laughs> Soften it. <laughs> and then clarify the important pieces. Mm. Yeah, it's not too defined in life, so it's... Yeah, and I think that's what happens sometimes, is that, similar to what I was saying before, you kind of fixate on something, trying to get it accurate and correct, and then it ends up looking weird because I'm not thinking about the context. And so then when I'm looking now at the spout and everything in the context of the entire painting and the entire setup, it's pretty low, con pretty low contrast. And I only really see like, you know, a highlight, a highlight or reflected light somewhere when I'm squinting down. So that tells me what the priorities are. And I make sure that those are okay. And then everything else can be more unified. Mm. Great thought. Yeah, we have 15 minutes left. I really like this stage when the paint is kind of tacky mm -hmm. and then you can pull or drag on top of it and have it mix. It's yeah, more like it's pretty where awesome. you start to get layering and then you can see the different layers. It's fun. Get some cool edges happening. Oh, nothing like some good edge work.
Alyssa gives a nice comment. I love how groups of artists, such as yourself, create communities for us all. Makes such a difference to those of us plugging away solo in the studio. Mm. Life changing. So big. Thanks. Oh, well, we appreciate it. Come visit. Come hang out with our community. Um, we'd love to see you. Where? Uh, who was that again, and where is she from? Um, Alyssa Alexandria. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing her name many times. If you're around the area, Alyssa, come by and visit. Say hey. We'd love to have you come by. Blue Mountains, NSW. Blue Mountains. Keep wanting to think Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm assuming that's not the same thing. Australia. Oh, well. <laughs> New South Wales. There it is. New South Wales. Gotcha. Well, um, just hop on a flight. Yeah. <laughs> Should we'll be pretty cheap these days, right? <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow or the next day, right? <laughs> well, we're here for you virtually and in spirit. Can't keep hanging out with us. Keep talking with us. We're going to get you through all the good days and the bad. To go in and through while we're getting close to the end. And I can work on value stuff. I want to make sure I'm working on some edge work too. And watch this be one of those things where I'm like, hi, you know, I'm going to work on some edge work. But after, right after this, one value thing, you know, 20 minutes later. <laughs> The stream has ended an yeah. hour ago. <laughs> Still working on values, yeah. <laughs> Gail says, I'll be using these videos perpetually for company while I work. Oh, good. So thanks so much. It really does help. Yeah, now, you know, now we have quite a few of them. So there's, there's hours and hours. You have company for days. Variety, like a bunch of seasons of your favorite TV show. Yep. Just watch and rewatch. Thought it'd be nice to make like a fun little dip right here so that it didn't feel totally boring with negative space. And then make sure that these values, because I'm still working on values, <laughs> are connecting. To be fair, we're always working on yeah, values. Yeah, that's right. Maybe when you're working on color, you're working on values. Mm-hmm. about those warm, cool relationships.
you know, I was watching, um, gosh, I can't remember his name now. That bothers me, but famous ac actor. I'm sure he's knighted because he's British. Um, but um, I was watching something on YouTube recently, and he was, he was talking about one of the more pivotal things someone said to him when he was in acting school and he was learning to act. He said he had an instructor. They were on stage, and they were uh, acting out a scene, and the, he had a, a, you know, a faux door that he was supposed to open, but there was a chair in the way. And... Um, he couldn't open the door to get into the scene to do his lines. And he looked at the director, and the director said, what are you doing? Keep going. And he's like, but there's this chair in the way. And he goes, use the difficulty. And um, he's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, if it's a comedy, fall over it. If it's a drama, smash it. <laughs> and uh, he said, and I never forgot that, where in every... Um, situation, we have an opportunity to use the difficulty. And I was like, wow, that can really be applied to painting, you know, where you might have had something happen in the painting and you're like, well, I don't know, that, that, that went wrong and I don't know what to do now. It's just like use it to your advantage, you know. Um, take those happy accidents and turn them into something, you know, and not uh, Alex, when he was, Alex Venezia, when he had gone to Ad Nerdrums to study, he's like, I just, like, I wanted to know how he did it, you know. And he, he said, oh, he doesn't even know in a way because he, what, what he does is he's like, well, if this happens, then I'm going to do this to make it fresh. And if this happens, then I'm going to do this to make it fresh. And so he always knows how to adapt with whatever he put down in order to make it fresh. And I was like, wow, you know, that's just, that's a fabulous piece of knowledge for people to know is use the difficulty. You have an opportunity every time to push and pull, to take what you, what you put down and turn it Turn the lemons into lemonade. Alyssa says it was Michael Caine. Michael Caine, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Caine, what a brilliant actor. Love him. And that's the beauty of us doing these community things is because I'm hoping that somebody else heard the same thing and can tell me who said the thing. <laughs> Gail is wondering if either of you have named any of the pumpkins yet. Oh, you know what? It's a, yeah, I haven't, but that we did that in school for our pear project. We had to name our pears in order to ensure that we understood their character and you know, got into it emotionally. <laughs> yes, I... Great tool. I think we should. Um, I'm taking names. Go ahead, everybody, submit your names. And we will decide what to name these pumpkins. Let's start with the white one. Um, and we will, I'm looking forward to hearing what people's suggestions are. Isabel says, excellent work. Thank you for the demonstration. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad that y'all had a good time. Yes, we're, we're getting, we're six minutes away. Um, six minutes away from turning into a pumpkin. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, it's getting bad. We got we to gotta stop this. Ooh. It's good to have, like, impasto black paint as your <laughs> last stroke. Oh, yeah. You get that last little touch, mm -hmm. you know. Wait, that goes... That doesn't go with my thin and warm and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, shadows atmosphere. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not quite what I was going for. I'm 
Michael Caine does a rendition of one of my favorite poems, too, of um, If by uh, Kipling. If you haven't heard it, go listen, go to YouTube and listen to Michael Caine's narration of If. It's beautiful. Gail says it's a pretty elegant pumpkin, Bianca. Bianca? There you go. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It also means white. Yeah. It reminds me of, um, it brings me back to my childhood where Rescuers Down Under, um, which was a Disney movie, and the two mice were Bernard and Miss Bianca. Bianca. Cesar says, Portugal, abrigado. Do we know what that means? Abrigado? Abrigado. I don't know what that means. Sounds like something I should know, but don't. Maybe someone will help us. I'm hoping. One can only hope. Uh, Alyssa says it means thank you. Ooh. Alyssa is answering all of our questions. She is. <laughs> Another reason why it was my favorite movie, Alyssa, is because it took place in Australia and I've always wanted to go. Now it's just getting down to that point where I'm just, just don't screw up, you know? We're, we're so close. Yeah. Honestly, this the is last where, minute. this is the biggest fear confrontation. Like, don't, don't have those thoughts. It's the final countdown. There it is. There it is. It's been playing in my brain. So. Has it? <laughs> yeah, okay. <more> <laughs> I will say that song transcends time. No, every generation knows that song. Make sure that little bit is right on the top here. We're at the one minute mark. One minute mark coming in. Coming in hot. All right, everybody. Thank you all again for joining. I hope that you are getting something out of this, and I hope that you're painting along. You know, we really want to see what work you're making. We have a whole new community. Part of the whole reason we want to do this is to start building a community that we can start sharing work with each other. Um, and so please join the Discord and show us what you're working on. Um, we're really, look, really looking forward to, to seeing that. So um, tomorrow, tomorrow we are doing a la prima day. We're going to take the same idea of what we're doing today and going to be adding, um, we're going to be adding color. So if you haven't noticed, there, we're building on concepts, thumbnail, you know, trying to get the idea of the, of, of the composition right. Then after that, working with um, values and value study. So trying to just get the hierarchy of the relationship happening. And then on top of that, now we're working with warm and cool, the relationship of how you can take warmth, warm and cool to create a dynamic relationship happening because that's going to happen in color. And then tomorrow, we're going to work on a la prima. If you're a layered painter, if you're a thin painter, this is your opportunity to try to make a full painting all at once, trying to work wet into wet. 
and building on the concepts that you've already done before. If you had been doing all those practice things beforehand, it'll get you set up for value control, which is the most important thing. And then, you know, we always say value does all the work. Color, color takes all the credit. Say it again. That last value bit. does all the work and color takes all the credit. There you go. And so making sure that those foundational things are first then putting on the next. Please send us what you're working on in Discord. We hope to see you there. There's a link in our description below. If you want more information about East Oak Studio, please sign up for our uh, newsletter. There's a link for you to sign up for our newsletter, and we'll make more announcements for when we're doing more challenges, when we have new content going up on our platform. We want you to be the first to know, and there'll be extra discounts and things that we also release in those things. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Just like everybody, you know what to do to help us get seen by more people. So let's build the community. Looking forward to seeing you next time. See you tomorrow.